All right, we're back at Byron P. Hall at Little Giants Stadium, and this was a great game, Steve. Uh, Little Giants in the playoffs under head coach Frank Navarro playing University of Minnesota at Morris. And uh, tight ball game. And uh, offensive coordinator Ken Bowen, Bowman called a timeout. He put in a shotgun offense. Crazy at the time. Shotgun. Crazy at the time. Yeah. And it was all little giants from there. And Wabash under All-American Dave Harvey beat the Cougars 37-21 at Little Giant Stadium. On there the were way. other big ones yeah. along the way. Yeah, and on the way to the Stag Bowl that year, as uh, most people who follow Wabash football know, uh, runner runners up to Widener. The 39 to 36 loss that year. Today, All right, in 1980, the Little Giants hosted DePaul in the Monon Bell game. The Little Giants were undefeated. They were 8-0. and oh. And DePaul came in, fired up, and they knocked the Little Giants out of the playoffs with a 22-22 tie. You can see how full the stadium was in 1980. That historic game. Yeah, they say 7,000 at that game, but keep in mind that was 7,000 without the extra bleachers, as you can see. So yeah. it just creates, you know, there was a rope put around the field. That was a restraining line, and uh, it was quite the atmosphere. I wasn't quite here for uh, for this one, but I was here in one other game, and you were too, Jim, when we did finish in a tie in the Monon Bell game, and back when we could tie. Yeah. And one of the best things college football has done is found a way to resolve ties. So DePauw, trailing by a touchdown, went the length of the field in under two minutes in this game. And here you're seeing the highlights of it. And scored. And went for two. Under coach Tommy Mott. And you can see the game film and how many people were on the field. And they hit the two-point conversion and ruined the Little Giants' perfect season. And Wabash would finish 8-0-1 in 1980. Yeah, and that was, that was part of the, uh, the years in there during the Coach Stan Parrish's years, where in his five years went 42-3-1, which uh, think about that, folks. Uh, that was right in the middle of it, and there was the one we just saw right there. Everybody said that 1981 team might have been the very best one, but 1982 was the perfect season. And Steve, you were in that game. Yes. Yeah, I was. I was on the team. I was the backup to uh, David Broker, and I think we are going to the 1982 game now. This is, yeah, let's look at the 1982 game. This is against Dayton. This is not a DePaul game, and Dayton had led 13 to seven. And uh, David Broker was the quarterback for the Little Giants, who were 9-0 and and playing a Dayton team that still had scholarship players on its team. And a right. little razzle-dazzle on the kickoff gave the Little Giants some pretty good field position. Broker just cool as a cucumber, delivering a strike. And it's really this next play, the one that people talk about. I believe it's the next one, the quarterback draw. You'll see him take three steps back and go, and it's designed that way. And watch how shifty he is running the football. And You know, Jim mentioned that they had scholarship players. I mean, I don't – unless you were around, you didn't realize what kind of win that was to beat Dayton. I mean, they were Division One, I, I believe, two years before, uh, and people just weren't beating them. They were winning national championships. Pass play. Oh, sorry, running play there. That's Eugene Anderson. Here's the pass play that gets it down near the goal line. Yep, Greg Mouch. Greg making it down to a two, and here it is. David Broker calls his own number, bounces off one flyer and into the end zone, and look at the crowd going nuts. There was a great photo that used to be up in our gym, Jim, that you remember maybe taken from up up top there. We could see our stands in the background and people jumping up and shows him crossing the uh, end zone. Joe Bevelheimer. Joe Bevelheimer with the all-important extra point and the Little Giants with a massive upset. 14-13 over Dayton, and that was a 10-0 perfect season yeah. at Little Giants Stadium.
What a game, what a year, and so many and giant moments here. Let's pause for a moment and thank our halftime sponsor, the Merrill Lynch Gregor Private Wealth Group. Um, we're so happy to have uh, Jake Knott and Marty Gregor as our sponsors of the halftime show. Gregor Private Wealth Group works with just a limited number of individuals and families, and they offer highly personalized boutique-style services and sophisticated strategies for your financial life. If you're uh, Life is more than investments. It's about your legacy, your family legacy across generations. And you need to call Jake Knott at 317-706-2051. Speaking of Jake Knott, we will be getting to Jake Knott here pretty soon. Yeah, not yet, though. Not I yet. We, I think next one up is 1986, isn't it, fellas? I believe so, yes. Let's, this one has audio, so we're not going to talk over it. That's Tim Plisky. <laughs> trying to fill in those great big shoes of Joe Bevelheimer's a year ago. Joe had a great career, and now the youngster, you see him concentrating, probably praying. This is a 34-yard field goal attempt. All the pressure in the world, the wind is blowing hard out of the southeast. This will be a very difficult kick for Plisky, the left-footed kicker. He wants that on the clock, 23-21 to Paul. The snap is there, the hold is there. And it's good! Tim Plisky, the sophomore out of Valparaiso, has given Wabash College a 24-23 lead with one minute, six seconds left on the scoreboard clock in the 93rd meeting of these two schools, the 55th battle for the Monon Bell. Now, this, this has got to be college football at its best, and I wish the whole country could see a game Time like out. this. Time out! They don't have any left, do they? Nine, eight, they don't have any seven, no left. timeouts left. No timeouts left. The ball looks three, like they're going to two, lose it. One. There is no time left. The flag is in the air. The ball not having any timeouts was not prepared it's for the field. Is it official? I don't see the, the official going in. They'd have to rough time well, clearing this field. It's just chaos. Pandemonium here right now. That one's special to me, Steve, not because of the way I called the end of the game, uh, but because it was uh, I, I got the opportunity to be the national play-by-play -play announcer on a satellite broadcast. And so special. Little Giants were dominated for three quarters, and Kelly House blocked a punt with his helmet that started a 17-point comeback that ended with Tim Plisky's field goal. And uh, when the game was over, Nick, Nick, they had, DePaul had an All-American field goal kicker in Tom Downham, and they couldn't get a timeout because they didn't have any left. And they, were, they got in field goal position, and I, I guarantee you Downham would have hit that field goal had they had enough time. But we thought, we thought a flag had been flown because when you look at that footage, somebody throws their hat in the air. <laughs> and we thought that there was a flag thrown at the end. And as you had said earlier, you know, in prior years here at the stadium, we'd had to move extra points to the other end of the field because the crowds were on the field. And we in the booth thought that we were going to have to get the people off the field, right. that there was still time left. But uh, really special win. Uh, that was my senior year and uh, just a lot of great memories from that one. When, as you heard uh, in, in the audio, they were, uh, you could hear you all talking about if the, if the officials went off the field or not, if there's still going to be time left on the clock. But I know they could have saved a timeout, but I remember I was up in the stands uh, that day, um, and was they had plenty of time to get one off. And they just couldn't quite get the team out there. Then you had guys shifting around, and yep. it just seemed to take them forever. And, and I'm certainly frustrating on on their half. But and the big cookies bumper sticker the next year said, <laughs> "Save a timeout, Nick." <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Rem Johnston. Yeah. Our next highlight also has uh, audio. This was the 101st Monon Bell Classic, and it was right here at uh, Little Giant Stadium, broadcast Welcome at 10 in the Little morning Giant on ESPN2. Stadium in Crawfordville, Indiana, where emotions are running high even before the kickoff. Well, Wabash has won the toss and has elected to receive. Chip Timmons is back, along with Pat Pinus, to receive for the Wabash Little Giants. And DePaul kicks it off at the 101st. Battle for the bell is underway. And the kickoff is received at the 20, the 25, the 40. He may go all the way. This is George Lino. George Lino. He's going for a touchdown. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The very first kickoff, George Lino goes all the way. Now Costa, who just kicked the extra point, he's lining up for the kickoff. Back to receive it is Sean Gardner, number 30. Number seven is John Holloway. They're standing on their three. You can hear some of the trash talking in the background. And it comes to number seven, John Holloway. And he's got a line. Holloway is losing the 50. John Holloway. 
Can you believe this? Two kickoffs back to back to start the football game. Aaron Nelson, I've been broadcasting college football for over 25 years, and I have never, ever seen anything like this before in my life. So that was a year when the National Hockey League had gone on strike. And ESPN had its A and a NHL broadcast group, its number one broadcast group, Tom Meese, was the play by play guy That's for their right. NHL package. And he came out with Darren Nelson, who was a former Vikings running back, and John Neighbor, the Olympic gold medalist swimmer. John Neighbor was part of that broadcast crew. Yeah. John Neighbor's grandfather was Fred Neighbor, who was a three sport athlete at Wabash College. And John sat on top of Goodrich Hall and did a little bit about his grandfather wearing his grandfather's Wabash letter, letter swimmer. It was a very special game for a lot of us. ESPN really shining a great light, and we uh, entertained them in a big-time way. That was 1994. 2002, Steve, was a real special year, uh, the, probably the greatest season in Wabash football history, and it started with an absolute rout of DePaul on uh, November 16, 2002. Let's take a look the at the Tigers highlights. of DePaul, 7-2, and two, and the undefeated and ninth-ranked Little Giants of Wabash College in the 109th battle for the Mononville. So we are down to a third and uh, about two or three yards. They could get a first down without scoring. Wide open in the end zone. Nobody that time came out of the defensive secondary to cover Ryan Short. And Short has his 13th touchdown reception of the year. Wabash wasting no time getting up to the line of scrimmage. Jake Knott back to throw into the end zone. Wide open touchdown. Great call by Chris Creighton to go for the jugular right after the special teams play. When DePaul tried that earlier, it didn't work. This time it does. Touchdown, Wabash. You called it, Joe. Good call, good catch by Ryan Short. Wabash has got it right now. Back to throw again. Wabash looking to get it. They've got a wide open receiver at the three and touchdown. And guess who? Four times today, Jake Knott and Ryan Short have connected on touchdown passes. And once again, Chris Creighton shows no mercy. The first snap after a big defensive play, they go right for the jugular. And what a day for the two senior leaders of this offense, Jake Knott and Ryan Short. Jake Knott, All-American, all-time leading passer, most touchdowns, most passing yards. Ryan Short, first team All-American tight end. Wow, I don't know how he could get open that open that many times, but four passes from not too short that resulted in touchdowns. And I tell you, Chris Creighton called off the dogs, or that one would have been really ugly. Yeah, and then quite a fitting way to end the regular season of that year as the the uh, not the short connection four times for touchdowns. Think, to, think about that. How many times do you see that in a game? Even any receiver to get four scores in a game is pretty phenomenal. Um, so uh, quite a way to finish. And then they went on, of course, to, uh, to lose a, a tough one at uh, Mount Union, but everyone was going to Mount Union getting beaten those years. But between those two, Two games was our next highlight package. 2002, Wabash beats Wittenberg. So this one was a good one. It uh, was kind of neck and neck in the first half, Steve. And if you recall, it was super cold. And in the second yeah. half, it started to snow. And Wabash's defense was just smothering. Chris Morris had a had a terrific uh, game as well. But Blair Hammer cemented himself as one of uh, the great football players in Wabash history. Uh, uh, Blair had a 30-yard return of an interception for a clinching touchdown, and then uh, Wittenberg scored late. But uh, that one was all Wabash. The defense recovered five Wittenberg fumbles, intercepted three passes, and made six quarterback wow. sacks. I did not remember the eight turnover, eight turnovers. Yeah. That's what we just said. Yeah. Uh, and you could get a good look at number two, Chris Morris there during the, uh, the some of those photos. Uh, Nate Boulay, number 41, was, was instrumental in that defense all year long. And you mentioned uh, uh, Blair Hammer in that game. That was a, a, a pivotal year for Wabash football. They would go 12 and one. They won at Wittenberg in overtime stomped DePauw here as we just watched and then the playoff win over Wittenberg was really that was Wabash being tougher, bigger, stronger than Wittenberg yes. and that, that hadn't happened to that point. So no, Wittenberg was real leveling dominating. of the playing field as you were as it would be uh, going forward in and, the North and Coast. The, uh, the year before was when we went over to Wittenberg and, and won. Um, 
playoff game against North Central. I was on an airplane flight on the way back from Paris, oh. and we landed uh, in the United States. And as soon as you could turn your phones on, the plane erupted because <laughs> all the students dialed in, and they realized that Wabash had come from behind to beat North Central. Let's check out back the Back to it. Joe Amick Third attempt at a two-point conversion to win the game. Little Giants trail by a point. Burke with the snap. Pump fakes, throws, it is caught! It was tipped by Krause, caught by Young! Little Giants have completed the comeback, and they lead it 29-28. The high pass and the tip. He wanted Krause, he tipped it, and Brady Young was right there and does a great job to get both feet down. And the Lowell Giants have scored 22 unanswered points to take the lead. Well, have outscored North Central in the second half, Joe. 29 to 7. I mean, that's something against this team. That was an unlikely win because backup quarterback Tyler Burke got beat like a bad rag doll in the first half and just stormed back with the Little Giants and went for two points and the win. Ball goes through the hands of James Krause. Brady Young catches it, taps his foot down. The Little Giants beat powerful North Central. And, and, and if people weren't here, they don't realize what kind of comeback that was because we were getting it handed to us. I mean, the first half, Joe Emick and I were doing that broadcast uh, we said, uh, you know, we don't see how we're going to turn this thing around. They were just beating us. We come out and score right away in the first drive of the second half, and then North Central goes back down and scores. Right. All right. Yeah. And I think I actually said the proverbial nail in the coffin after their score there because it just felt like they were beating us. And then what was weird about that comeback, I know we got some more to get to here, is there was no uh, big interception return, no big block kick, no kick return. We just started winning and started making plays, and they just didn't see it happening. And to get out of there with a win uh, uh, was something. I will compare that to that Dayton win in the second here. My personal favorite team, I think, I love that uh, Jake, not 2002 team, but the 2015 team was really special. They had Mason Zurich, uh, first team All-American running back. We saw him break Stan Huntsman's single game rushing record down at DePaul. One of us got knocked unconscious in that game, taking pictures on the sideline. Uh, and then came the playoffs and one humdinger of a game and it was a blizzard. And we didn't have this little plexiglass in front of us, and the wind and the snow were howling up into our broadcast booth. And Mason Zurich got it done one more time. Let's watch Wabash beat Albion on November. Welcome to Byron P. Hollett, Little Giant Stadium on the campus of Wabash College. I'm Jim Amadon alongside Steve Hoffman, and we've probably got the best seats in the house on this snowy day when the Little Giants host the Britons in NCAA playoff action. Third down 14 for the Little Giants. Fakes the handoff. Rice has got a lot of time. He's throwing it deep for Oliver Page. Touchdown, Little Giants! Oliver Page catches the bomb on third down and 13. Half a minute to go first quarter. Bona fakes the handoff. He's looking deep, and he's sacked, and the ball comes out. Carter Ludwig with the sack, and the fumble recovered by Tyler McCullum. Little Giant football. Big deal, and you need that on a day like this. The ball. Mason again, left side. He's got a hole. He's going to go. Mason Zurich, 29 yard touchdown, Little Giants. Well, it's interesting plays, and now it brings Zurich in and just giving him the ball. And it's Mason Zurich going left, and he's going to break it. We knew it was going to happen today, Jim. He had 102 yards at halftime. Mason Zurich, but it's 10, 5, touchdown, Mason Zurich, 70 yards. I don't know how Shepard didn't get him. Mason Zurich somehow found another uh, gear on his 38th carry. Mason Zurich set the single game rushing record over 300 yards in that blizzard. Uh, and you know, really, the, the play of the game was Connor Ludwig jumping over an offensive lineman and with one hand sacking the quarterback and causing a fumble. That was literally a <laughs> once in a lifetime kind of play. Yeah, and we had a halftime, if I remember, from probably literally about 40 or 45 minutes, maybe longer. I don't remember. Yeah, about what 40 it was. minutes. Yeah. About 40 minutes, but while we cleared the snow from the field, and it just came out of nowhere. I mean, I think there was a slight chance in the forecast, something like that, if I remember. And all of a sudden, it was.
that was there. So um, it was worse than I remembered looking at that bit, that footage there. That was a lot of fun to call that with you, Jim. Giant moments in Little Giant Stadium history. Thank you to Adam Phipps and Brent Harris and Becky Went and everybody in communications that put together that great package of historical photos and video from across the era at Little Giant Stadium. A uh, lot of more games we could have included there, but that was a nice package. Thanks, everyone, for contributing to it.